issues, please bring it up in the Q&A and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So jumping right in, when people talk about globalization, and here I mean, you know, when you read, say, somebody like Tom Friedman, even, the, the most common sense, everyday notion of globalization is that it flattens out difference. I mean, so there's a kind of McDonaldization McDonald of the world. The first thing that I want to emphasize is that I don't know how exactly it flattens the world out. What it does do is that, on the one hand, it opens up a whole sea of opportunities and possibilities. On the other, it actually deepens social cleavages. So in a country like India, where you have a diversity of religions, of communities, of ethnic groups, one of the effects of globalization has been to actually deepen already existing cleavages in society. At the same time, it's an exciting moment because it also opens up several potentialities. And I want to focus on three areas in my talk today, which appear as huge problems, but I want to suggest they, that they also open up a whole sea of possibilities, and it's really for us to see how things pan out. Uh, and all of these problems require the government, civil society, uh, a kind of international uh, awareness raising for it to work out in a more harmonious and in a felicitous way. But we don't really know how each of these problems are going to resolve themselves. Now the first problem that I want to talk about is the rising tide of Maoist insurgency in India. In the map over there, the, the places which are in bright red actually shows the areas which are most deeply affected, and then it, it lightens up. Like, so the, the light yellow is actually pointing to areas where the Maoists are trying to get in. Now, as you know, uh, you know Mao Zedong is long dead, but in certain sectors in India, he's alive and well. And, um, one of the ways in which um, this is a very, it's a, it's a people's movement, it's an extremely violent movement, and its uh, stated objective is the overthrow of the Indian state. Now how does this movement strengthen itself? It strength, it, or it has gained in strength because it has managed to give voice or represent a part of the Indian population which was almost forgotten by the state. And this was, the, this is really um, the 80 million tribal people in India. You know, when you, when, usually when you talk about in India, you're invariably talking about Hindu-Muslim conflicts, or you're talking about caste conflicts. In this case, I want to draw your attention to the tribal problem, which for the 60 years that the country has been independent, I think in most of India has forgotten its 80 million tribals. These are people who inhabit all of those bells have, are very rich in minerals, they are very rich in forests, they have some of the fastest flowing rivers, and these people actually inhabit these regions. And you can see that as the Indian economy opened up in 1991 to multinational capital, the state actually aggressively started a program of taking over these areas. People were dispossessed, not rehabilitated properly. Uh, the memorandums of understanding, or MOUs as they are called, that the state signed with gigantic corporations like SR Steel or Tata Iron and Steel, the memorandums of understanding were not made public. Nobody knows how much the tribals received by way of compensation. As these dams were built, they were evicted from places where, where they lived. So there was, there was serious, serious want in this area. In this entire, I mean, it's, it's referred to in uh, government parlance and in police parlance as the Red Corridor, because this is the area where the Maoists are the strongest. So at a time when these people were actually undergoing tremendous material hardship, and the Indian state, Indian civil society, people like myself also, all but forgot about them, it's, it's around that time that the Maoists actually began to infiltrate these regions. So in a sense, they were the only sympathizers that the people had. Having said that, what their agenda, however, was to wage 
full-scale war, and they use the word war against the Indian state. And at the moment, what we have there is really bloody battle. Uh, earlier, or late last week, there was an incident where 76 uh, policemen were massacred. Maoists routinely blow up school buildings, whatever few hospitals and dispensaries there are. So in a sense, it's become this war between the state representing development and the Maoists sort of opposing development in an area where people are really crying out for some kind of state help. But the way in which politics has panned out with the state having neglected uh, the population over there for so many years and the Maoists having taken up their cause, it's really a very polarized debate. 